Good morning, everyone. I'm Eric Lufer, the president of the Citizens Research Council of Michigan. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Citizens Research Council's panel discussion on youth mental health crisis and the school-based health services. The Citizens Research Council is a statewide nonpartisan public affairs research group. This is our 105th year of operation, a longevity we attribute to our promotion of sound public policy for state and local governments through accurate, independent, and objective research. We are a private, not-for-profit organization, and we rely on the charitable contributions of foundations, businesses, corporations, and individuals. I'd like to encourage all of you to join our circle of supporters and help us to continue to provide high-quality, independent information on important public policy topics in Michigan. If you value our, this webinar and the paper that will be coming out soon addressing these issues, I encourage you to uh, follow our work and support it to the extent you're able. So we have uh, obviously a slide deck here of uh, the talking points. You can find this file on our website. If you click on the events tab, you'll see this is the, uh, the second thing listed, I think. Um, and you'll see the link there. We are also recording this and we will put that link on that uh, web page as well after all the YouTube cycling goes through that is necessary for that. We have everyone on mute uh, except for the speakers, obviously. Um, if you have any questions, and I encourage you to ask questions, uh, the GoToWebinar panel has a place to ask questions. I will collect those and we'll have uh, obviously panel discussion at the end, the ability to work through, the, uh, get through all the things. So why are we here? Uh, as you know, children and adolescents in Michigan are experiencing alarming increases in the prevalence of mental, emotional and behavioral health conditions. Although mental health concerns have been rising at a rapid rate while the nation contends with COVID-19, this trend, along with its underlying causes and risk factors, was underway long before the coronavirus pandemic began. A lot of attention is focused on how schools will be addressing learning loss next year when students are back in the buildings. I contend we need to think as much about their mental health needs as they get back into the buildings as well. A forthcoming Citizens Research Council of Michigan paper will discuss the ways schools are uniquely suited to assist youth with their mental health concerns. Youth spend most of their time within school buildings, providing a greater chance for the identification of mental health concerns and referral to treatment in this education, educational milieu that exists even in conventional and even uh, even more so than in conventional settings. As places centered around learning, schools are also the perfect vector to deliver information about mental health and teaching skills that foster resilience. Because schools are also venues of socialization and psychological development, they are important venues for dismantling stigma and normalizing treatment-seeking behaviors. So we're going to start today with a uh, short, presentation on, on our upcoming paper uh, by Tim Mischling. Tim joined the Research Council in 2016 after working for several years as a legislative aide in the House of Michigan House of Representatives, as well as lecturing at, the, at Oakland University and the University of Michigan Flint. He has master's degrees in both public administration and public health and graduate certificates in economic development and public health practice from Wayne State. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree in history from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, with the Research Council, most of his work is in public health and health policy. Following the discussion, we'll have a, a panel, discuss, uh, panel uh, forum talking roundtable with um, Christy Buck, Ron Kohler, and Kevin Stotts. And, and we'll go through some little biography with them after Tim's presentation. So with that, um, again, I encourage everyone to use the, the question uh, 
portal if you have anything that you need amplifying or if Tim raises any issues you would like the panel to dig in on. And with that, let me turn it over to Tim. Thanks so much, Eric, uh, for the great introduction. So as Eric mentioned, we're looking today at school-based approaches to youth behavioral health. Um, we're in the midst of what a lot of people have described as a youth mental health crisis, uh, and we're seeing it on the news, particularly since the advent of COVID. Um, some of the statistics are alarming that one in five youth now have a diagnosable mental health disorder. Um, this results in significant impairment for, for many youth and mental health conditions um, often follow children into adulthood, particularly if they don't receive treatment. Um, this affects not only academic success, but occupational success and long-term economic and social outcomes for these individuals. Uh, so what's causing this? Um, well, it's it's not COVID um, because when we look at, for instance, the graph here of major depressive episodes in the past year by age group, uh, we can see a dramatic increase in younger age cohorts over the last decade. Um, it, this is also not because of just an increase in, in diagnosis. Certainly that's happened in history where we develop new diagnostic techniques. Um, and that leads to a spike in, in the prevalence of a specific condition. Um, neither one of those is, is totally explaining this increase, uh, which is not to say that COVID hasn't had an impact on mental health, but that's, you know, the impacts of COVID are, are piling on top of a long growing crisis that we're facing. Uh, so how are we doing in Michigan? Again, the answer is not great. Um, oftentimes, when we look at health statistics, Michigan fares worse on average than the nation. Uh, and we can see here that in 2007, um, the Great Lakes region was a little better than the United States as a whole. Michigan, an outlier there with a slightly higher uh, percentage of major depressive disorders uh, or episodes, excuse me. Um, and now, it, with our most recent data in 2019, we can see not only precipitous growth in Michigan, an increase of 83%, but also growth in the Great Lakes region as a whole. Related to the crisis in youth mental health, uh, we also see over the last 20 years, uh, an increase in suicide rates. Um, now, suicide is not always a direct consequence of something like a depressive disorder, or other mood disorder, anxiety disorder, uh, but these disorders, as well as substance use disorders, do increase suicide risk. Uh, if we compare uh, 2009 to 2018, the average suicide death rate among adolescents and young adults increased from seven to 10.3 persons per 100,000 in the United States. And in Michigan, that was from 6.7 to 11.4 persons per 100,000. Uh, so that's an increase of 47.1% for the US and 70.1% for Michigan. Um, suicide is now the second leading cause of death for people aged 10 to 24, surpassed only by motor vehicle fatalities. Uh, and when we see statistics like this, they're, they're jarring. Um, and it's important to recognize that suicide is not merely an individual phenomenon, but that community and societal factors also play a role in suicide risk. So we want to look holistically not only at individual diagnoses, but at the presence of social support and social cohesion within states, within individual communities. Um, we want to look at the availability of services and treatment. Uh, we look at individual and societal attitudes that might inhibit asking for help. So much of the research uh, for people experiencing suicidal ideation shows that they didn't seek out treatment or help because someone told them to tough it out or they were embarrassed. They didn't want to disclose their problems. They felt that it was, you know, it was stigmatized. Um, 
And there's also factors in society that facilitate discrimination against others, whether they're part of the LGBTQ community, uh, whether they're an obese individual, whether they're a person of color, uh, or various other factors. Um, it's also important to look at childhood trauma uh, and recognize that adverse childhood experiences are highly predictive of long-term health, uh, the mental, physical, and social health of individuals. As a state, we do good work on ACEs, we do good work on mental health, on substance abuse, on suicide prevention, uh, but we need to do a better job at recognizing how all these things are interrelated uh, in integrating our approach to this as well as to physical health. The youth mental health crisis that we're facing comes in a context of really an absence uh, and lack of behavioral health treatment options. Uh, Michigan has numerous uh, designated health professional shortage areas throughout the state. Uh, a majority of counties in Michigan have no child or adolescent psychiatrist. Uh, many also have no PhD psycholog psychologist. Um, and even when we expand to look at all types of behavioral health providers, including social workers, uh, licensed professional counselors, psychiatric uh, advanced practice nurses, uh, we still see shortage areas through much of the state. Uh, and this is problematic for obvious reasons, because even if people decide that they need treatment, uh, we have this barrier of, of availability where there's not the supply of providers to meet the demand within the population. Additionally, because many providers tend to cluster in some of our more affluent and urban areas, um, we have a maldistribution that affects uh, predominantly rural and, and northern Michigan. Um, I believe the data show that half of the child and adolescent psychiatrists in Michigan are in just three counties, which are Washtenaw, Oakland, and Wayne. Um, so factors uh, like telehealth uh, can help to address this shortage. Um, as we look to other barriers, in addition to the, the shortage and maldistribution of providers, we have some structural barriers that are identified, such as transportation, insurance coverage and networks, waiting times, and cost that's often identified by individuals, um, as well as social barriers, uh, information deficit, lack of knowledge about how to find mental health treatment, um, lack of knowledge about things like mental health first aid. Uh, we have norms and values that I mentioned uh, where some people may not feel that their condition warrants professional intervention or help. Um, and that interrelates really heavily with stigma. So there are a lot of different barriers here. There's no single solution to address all of these barriers. Really, you need to address either individual barriers or clusters of them with different policies. Um, many of those have been identified in other research. Uh, as I said, utilizing telehealth uh, to expand coverage, um, Medicaid expansion has facilitated um, insurance coverage for, for individuals in Michigan that not only benefit of the parents that, that became eligible for Medicaid, but also their children, because when parents have access to healthcare services, they're more likely to take their children in for checks as well. Um, and we've also seen um, strategies to decrease waiting times, uh, so there are lots of ways to, to address this, um, but one of the more promising ones that we think deserves more attention um, is addressing all of these barriers uh, within the educational context, because as Eric mentioned, um, young adults, children, and adolescents uh, spend, other than maybe in the home, the, the majority of their time in schools. Um, so I'm sure there are people listening who are saying, you know, why schools? We already have too many things to do. Our job is to teach to teach children. Um, and that's not something that's dis disputed. Um, schools can't be everything to every child, um, much as we'd like them to be. Um, students can't replace uh, entirely parents and home environments. 
Um, but schools are somewhere where we have a degree of planning capacity and, and somewhere where we can stage policy interventions. And it's also useful to look at the sort of interrelationship between health and education. Um, student health affects their academic and occupational success. This is something that we've known for a long time. Um, when we look within schools, a student's health also impacts their peers and their school environment. And this isn't just true for infectious diseases like COVID-19, uh, but also for mental health disorders where we often see a social contagion effect that, you know, having a depressed student um, will affect their, their peers. Having um, students acting out in class, you know, it interrupts the, the learning environment. Uh, and also influences the mood and emotions of, of other students. Um, and there we can see the ways that student health is intertwined with discipline and attrition and the way schools sometimes interface with the juvenile justice system. Education also impacts health. And um, when we look at long-term health outcomes, uh, things like life expectancy at birth, or particularly life expectancy at 25 once education has been achieved, we see lifelong health benefits for individuals. Um, and there are also social and intellectual developmental issues that influence health-related behaviors. And so as we uh, become more educated, uh, we can increase things like health literacy that affect rates of substance abuse, that affect our nutritional intake, our physical activity, and other things that might support uh, better health. But when we look in schools in Michigan, um, we have pretty paltry ratios of health providers to, to students. Um, when it comes to school counselors, social workers, psychologists, nurses, uh, we come nowhere near meeting um, recommended ratios. And in all cases, excepting social workers, uh, we do worse than the U.S. as a whole. Um, and I wouldn't count doing better on social workers as a victory because we could quadruple the number of social workers in schools and still not have uh, the recommended student to social worker ratio. Um, for the reasons that we've discussed, I think that it, it should be fairly apparent that investing in, in student health is a wise investment when we want to achieve other things like academic success and later occupational preparedness. Another option uh, to intervene in student health are school-based and school-linked health centers. Um, these are typically, they, they can look different ways, but they're fully functioning primary health care providers that provide um, a variety of screenings as well as uh, mental health counseling. Currently, there are around 200 school-based or school-linked health centers and programs in Michigan. Um, the attractiveness of school-based health centers is that they remove several of the barriers that were discussed previously. So typically, um, these services are provided at no cost to students, uh, utilizing a variety of different funding mechanisms and insurance reimbursements uh, to cover services. Um, it removes some of the transportation and logistical barriers that were discussed. It facilitates a warm handoff between, for instance, a school counselor and uh, a mental health uh, care provider who could provide additional counseling for students. And the presence of school-based health centers has been shown to remove some of the stigma of seeking treatment and to get students accustomed to knowing where to find help and seek it out. Um, and these treatment-seeking behaviors ideally follow uh, youth into adulthood, um, as well as following students out into the, into the community. And so there's also quite a bit of research that supports the idea that school-based health centers not only benefit students, but benefit their families as well. Um, Michigan has been successful in um, getting approval from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services federally to obtain Medicaid reimbursement for 
uh, mental health services provided in schools, uh, which traditionally was only, that reimbursement mechanism was only available to students with an IEP. Um, we also have leveraged uh, numerous grant mechanisms. And then it, as of 2019, uh, there's funding uh, in section 31N of the school aid budget to provide additional support uh, for behavioral health in schools. Um, although when we look at the scale of need that we have relative to the funding amount, which began um, just north of 30 million and has migrated up a bit since then, um, the, the funding could be doubled or even tripled and would come nowhere near to scaling up to the cost. Uh, when we look at West Michigan, we can see that we have a, a cluster of school-based health centers uh, in Grand Rapids, as well as Muskegon uh, and some other communities. The map cuts off a little um, high there uh, on the south, but there are no other school-based health centers uh, south of Grand Rapids until you get to uh, Battle Creek. Traditionally, school-based health centers uh, are located in schools in low-income areas. This model started in the 1970s as a way to extend healthcare services to medically underserved populations. And so students in schools with a school-based health center in general are less likely to have a usual source of primary care and to have some of the other transportation and cost barriers that we talked about. That being said, the success of this model um, and its effectiveness uh, makes it something that should really be considered for all students, regardless of the demographic makeup or Medicaid eligibility of students within a given district. There are additional strategies uh, to address mental health in schools that don't rely solely on providers. We typically like to talk about a three-tiered approach that provides general environmental and population level preventative efforts that are available to all students to support them, uh, as well as intermediary interventions for students who become more at risk of developing conditions or have some of the signs and symptoms of, of minor mental, emotional, or behavioral health issues, um, as well as more uh, substantial and robust support for students who need it. Um, and we can facilitate this not only by having school social workers and school nurses who I would reiterate are probably the ideal uh, individuals to mount you know, population level health interventions within schools, uh, but also by training and giving support to educators, not so that they replace you know, a social worker or a nurse, but so that they can uh, better understand issues and work together uh, collaboratively. Um, and ideally, we have a system where we have school health professionals like those school nurses and social workers and psychologists able to focus on preventative strategies and to focus on instructional support to educators, planning support to administrators, and then have either the presence of a school-based health center or other community clinics or robust primary care availability so that students in need of additional individual treatment can be referred um, in a very direct way to those providers. Um, school environment uh, is very important. This is, you know, the context that, that students are developing, uh, not only intellectually, but socially and emotionally within. And so the base level of preventing bullying and discrimination, I think, is self-evident that students who feel safe and feel accepted have better mental health outcomes. That's, that's both logical and something that's bared out by the research. Um, something that I think we recognize less is that some of the factors in schools like school arts and music programs, uh, extracurricular activities and nutrition, these also have major effects on school, on, on student health outcomes. And so as this paper makes recommendations to scale up the number of health professionals in schools and to provide support for the school-based health model as well as other community school models and wraparound services as appropriate to individual communities. It's important to realize that that 
is not an aspirational recommendation. That's a bare bones recommendation to meet the foundation of what's necessary for students to be healthy, well supported and ready to learn. And really what we'd like to see, you know, schools thinking about are expanding um, school art and music curricula, for instance, to include social emotional learning within those, uh, those environments, as well as bringing in um, board certified music therapists to stage other types of interventions. So there are lots of aspirational goals that we can make that maybe sound like pie in the sky, uh, but that should put into context that having the adequate number of social workers and nurses and ensuring that all students have basic access to treatment isn't aspirational. That's, that's a bare bones policy recommendation that current policies aren't moving quickly enough to address given the scope and increase of incidence of disorders among youth. And so with that, I will uh, turn it over to our panelists because I can feel Eric giving me the cut it off uh, signal. Thanks, Tim. Uh, yeah, so let's get into it. Uh, first, I wanna recognize Wynn Irwin who helped to put all this together. Wynn is one of our uh, members of our board of directors with the Citizens Research Council and a uh, very active citizen uh, over on the west side of the state. We're very thankful to have him on our board. Uh, so our panel today, I'm gonna be very brief so we can get into it. Christy Buck is the executive director of the Mental Health Foundation of West Michigan. She's been doing this a long time, uh, almost as long as I've been with the Research Council and that doesn't make either of us feel any younger. Uh, very passionate about doing this, working with, uh, working in the educational setting. In addition to that work, she's also a member of the Granville School Board, um, as well as many other community organizations and coalitions. Ron Kohler, as I understand it, can remove the interim from his title and is now the superintendent of Kent ISD. Um, he started that role just a few months ago in January. Uh, prior to that, he had retired as the assistant superintendent of organizational and community initiatives and legislative affairs. Um, like Christy and I has been doing this a long time and um, and then Kevin Stotts is with us. He's the president of Talent 2025, a CEO-led effort in West Michigan to improve the quality of the region's talent development, attraction, and retention efforts. Uh, he has a long history of working with business, education, workforce, and economic development leaders, as well as policymakers. Um, prior to his involvement with Talent 2025. He's led several not-for-profit organizations related to uh, many of these same issues, education, workforce, community development, and, and services. So um, I think you've all unmuted. Let me go through. We have a few questions that were asked. Um, well, let, let me, before we get into the questions, let me give each of you a chance to respond to uh, what Tim said and, and how this applies to your professional um, roles with each of your organizations. Christy, let's go first. Well, good morning, everyone. And it's great to be here with um, such an, um, an amazing report for all of us. Um, many things for me are not startling. I've been doing mental health education, suicide prevention work in schools for the past 15 years. And so many of the programs that we bring into the schools um, are centered around um, becoming aware, destigmatizing mental health disorders so we can talk freely about them. Um, allowing students to get involved is a big piece of the pie of how we're gonna make changes with mental health education and suicide prevention ultimately. So um, I'm thankful to Tim, I'm excited to see where this goes and what type of changes we will be able to make, um, but a report like this is compelling. And thank you, Tim, it was so easy to understand also. And I think that's so important in many studies is, is that we make it easy to understand so people can read it and know that there's there's things that are being done, but there's much needed changes. Mm -hmm. 
And then, Ron, I introduced you second. Let's stay with that order. Thank you, Eric. And uh, thank you for shining a, a light on this issue and uh, helping more people understand the challenges we face. Um, you know, uh, for me, uh, and I believe for all of our superintendents, it's, you know, it's a moral imperative for us to be able to understand these challenges that students face and to help our staff and all of our uh, educators uh, deal with them and to overcome, help those students overcome them. Because if they don't, they may not be able to graduate, they may not be able to obtain a college degree or a career credential, and if they fail to do that, they'll be unlikely to be able to support themselves and a family. It's our job to make sure we get them across that finish line, and so it's essential that every educator understand these challenges be able to address them in their own way and ensure that students can be a welcome, feel welcome in the classroom. Kevin, how about you? Um, well, first I want to um, say good morning and thank you, Eric, for inviting me to be a part of this, this panel. Um, really one, like Christy said, I'm really impressed with the report, you know, these, um, you know, having uh, two teenagers and a sixth grader, soon to be another teenager, um, just kind of immersed in a lot of these issues, just seeing things happen within their schools, et cetera, and the challenges that their, their peers have. Um, and so the, the fact that the report is very plain spoken and laying out the problem uh, for Michigan, I think is a first great step in terms of getting to solutions. And so I just applaud Tim and the team at CRC for putting together a great report. Um, we um, um, are really focused on innovating education in K-12 education. And so um, when we look at the impact of mental health issues among students, diminish learning gains and if untreated these issues then persist into adulthood as the report talks about so uh so from a talent development standpoint for the region and, and our and the region's employers you know addressing these issues and helping students early on with identification and treatment um and not allowing it to go untreated um you know, and then persisting into the workforce um, is an important thing for, for the entire community. And we just did a session with our employers around uh, mental health in the workplace sort of coming out of COVID. And, um, uh, and it's really quite stark what's happening within employers right now. And you think about this as a persistent issue that's going to um, impact uh, employers in the long term if, if, if untreated. Um, is something that we should all be aware of. So I really appreciate CRC for leading this um, this issue and, and bringing it to light. All right, so one of the questions asked by our, our guest while they were registering, um, Christy, let's start with you. Can you speak to the interest of and things to keep in mind related to assessing ACE scores and providing interventions in the schools? Wow, that's, I mean, it's one of the most compelling studies that has ever been done. And um, there's a film that's called Paper Tigers. Um, I would encourage as many people to see this because it's eye awakening at really what an, what an ACE is, all right? And then the possibility to know what an individual's ACE score would be, and those would be the number of adverse childhood experiences, right, um, would be so compelling to a district to be able to move this child through the system, through their education, knowing what supports they need. You know, I heard a great story of a speaker one day at a conference I went to at the Kent Intermediate School Districts, and she was an individual who experienced a multitude of ACEs. And yet, her, short, her story went on to say, she went on to go to college, to graduate, to attain her certificate in teaching, and then going on to work at the ISD. And so probably a long time ago, she wasn't even gonna be put in the game because she's got such a, I'll just put it like this, screwed up life, okay? And kids that are experiencing these things going on at home need love and attention. And she really credits a teacher who was her mentor all throughout her school, I get the chills talking about it. 
because these are real things and we know that these adverse childhood experiences will forever, they're there and they can either be used in, in a good way to strengthen and help people build resiliency, right? Or the other way, or people end up, end up, you know, never being employed, major health risks, struggling with a mental health disorder that may never have gone diagnosed. Um, I'm really, really super impressed and proud of um, our Kent Intermediate School District for really focusing on ACEs and ACEs training. I saw oodles of teachers going through all the time taking the training. So um, it's important. And if you don't know what an ACE is, just Google it and start to read. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we have two questions on the school-based health centers that let me package together. Uh, so first, what are the barriers in the way of more districts getting the school-based health centers? Uh, and then you sort of the, the flip side of it is that minors cannot consent to some basic health care services. How might this be a challenge to the effectiveness or, or even some communities' desires to get the school-based health centers in their communities? Um, Ron, can you take that one? Or? Um, yeah, I, I will say this. You know, there um, there are some uh, barriers to overcome with school-based health centers, and uh, they may be lifted with uh, greater access to Medicaid dollars and braided funding. Uh, one of the things that we did here in Kent uh, some 13 years ago was working with the county and uh, other entities, we created the Kent School Services Network. And that is a network, uh, sort of a community school model. 40 of our buildings, uh, school buildings that are uh, greater than 50% free and reduced lunch or greater than 50% uh, at-risk students have a community school coordinator, have a clinical therapist, and uh, their job is to understand the impediments to student success and overcome them. So the clinical therapist will provide uh, the counseling support. The community school coordinator will work with the broader community and identify resources that might stabilize that student and his or her family so that it makes it, it overcomes the barriers to attendance and engagement. Uh, that has been in our community uh, an area where our schools have gravitated toward that and we expect many more districts and school buildings to use their uh, coronavirus relief funds to participate in in that program which tim you you referenced as wraparound services what about the challenge side the the idea that um some parents, some communities might not like not having the control of the health care that their children are receiving. How, what do we do about that? You know, if I'll, I'll take the first shot, but I think that's something for Christy as well. Um, you know, what we learned when we were developing the uh, Kent School Services Network, uh, we did a series of focus groups because that was one of the questions that was posed or barrier that was posed, uh, the stigma of students being identified as going to a mental health professional in the school. And uh, what we found both in uh, from students and their parents was they would prefer to have those services available to them in the school. And we've also found our experience has been that many more minority students access services of this sort than they would otherwise uh, if they're available in the school. Christy, you wanna take that too? Sure, and that again, it's stigma and it goes with people not being educated and informed about what these actually are, the great services they provide, the ability for um, it to work for when both parents are working and you're unable to take time off to get your child to an appointment, a necessary appointment, and that would be for any health issue. Um, I've seen them firsthand at work and I just get, I'm so impressed. But, um, you know, we need, we need help from um, media outlets, 
from um, articles, just ways of communicating the correct information surrounding what these are. If we could have as much airtime as was given to the coronavirus for something like mental health, <laughs> that is, I'm, I'm just gonna say this, is just as serious, all right? And this has been around for a lot longer than we've been dealing with the virus. If we could be talking about mental health, mental health disorders as much, and the positivity that could be brought by these school-based centers would be just incredibly phenomenal. So um, again, reducing stigma, increasing awareness about what these centers would actually do. Yeah, I know Tim wants to chime in, but I, I'm encouraged, uh, Naomi Watts, uh, Naomi, the tennis player, I'm blanking on her last name. Uh, oh, just, Atsuka, Atsuka. There you go. Uh, just bowed out of the French Open uh, mm -hmm. fighting mental health. And and we saw with the Detroit Lions, Titus Young, and, and, and there's others. So I think high profile people coming forward um, and, and often role models for our young people. Uh, there's an opportunity to to bring this conversation to the forefront, I think, a little bit more and, and deal with that. Kim, you wanted to weigh in on this. Yeah, I think uh, like Ron and, and Christy, I agree everything they've said, and certainly the the graded funding options and the Medicaid funds may help to remove some of the financial barriers to school-based health centers. I think there are also, you know, some logistical barriers that get both at, you know, the finance side as well as the stigma side and that when you're starting a school-based health center, you really need the capacity, you know, the staff capacity to have someone who's a champion for the center to, because it involves a lot of, uh, memorandums of agreement between your medical sponsor, between the school district, between other agencies that may be providing support. Um, and what we've seen in Michigan, both with the lack of, you know, for instance, again, the school social workers, psychologists and nurses who maybe could do some of that work in reaching out to the community and interfacing with other health providers, um, as well as our local you know, public health departments who are bare bones staff, and we've seen the consequences of that during COVID. Um, it's a previous CRC report highlighted all of our issues in funding public health. Um, the lack of strategic capacity to do the planning, um, whether it's in the school or in the public health department, I think that um, is really a barrier to making some of these changes because you need someone who is getting all the ducks in a row and building community support. And once you have the support of, of parents, families, other community members, uh, places of worship and businesses within the community, um, that's one of the best ways to destigmatize the treatment and, and generate excitement for the center. Kevin, let's turn to you. Uh, you made in your comments, you alluded to the um, interest of the business community. Um, it strikes me that students with mental health, health issues uh, eventually become members of the workforce with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so a, a proactive uh, involvement by the business community might help to, to eventually have a, a healthier workforce involvement at the school setting uh, workforce later on. What role do you see the business community playing in this uh, this field and and not only in, in the Grand Rapids area, but thinking statewide, uh, what's the role for business in this? Yeah, well, you know, as, as Ron knows from our work with him over the years, I mean, we really have um, used data and research to identify what the big gaps and challenges are related to it, you know, education or workforce development or um, and other talent talent needs of the region. So, um, what the report just identifies and sort of elevates is this sort of, I think, not so um, understood problem that is kind of um, undermining student performance and the development of talent in the long term. And so, um, and, and the report I think also um, um, explains that you know if 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 uh, a student's mental health issues go untreated, 
and they persist. They they will of course persist in adulthood. So early identification, I think, is key. Um, but it's also just acknowledging that we have a problem and we have to address it. And you just can't um, let it go untreated because it's going to have an impact on the lives of these um, of the students who are suffering, and then also impacting the workforce um, in the long term. And so. Um, you think about it as ad addressing a core issue and challenge that we have in terms of our uh, in terms of our uh, within K to 12 education. So I think for business, it's you know being part of um, um, you know a coalition to say, hey, we need to address this as a as a community as a, and as a state with public policy changes and um, uh, perhaps funding strategies to get at. Um, the treatment necessary that's needed in schools, and and also maybe in terms of um, um, destigmatizing and and elevating awareness amongst parents. We've talked about this before the call. Is that employers also have employ a lot of parents and extended family members. So just communicating out that you know um, how we might destigmatize mental health issues and and support people and 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 identifying that they have a need for help and. Um, and encouraging that, I think, is also something that can be done from a sort of a, a public awareness standpoint. Yeah. Um, seeing the business community as, as really part of the, the overall community um, and, and getting the, everyone involved in, in dealing with mm -hmm. these issues. Mm -hmm. Let's think about... Um, the workforce in the schools related to these school-based health centers. Tim identified uh, the need for teacher training and better identifying. And, and Christy, you mentioned that you were at a, a session. Um, can you talk to our, our viewers a little bit about what's currently going on and where are the opportunities for improvement? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think this is both in the school or like in the universities teaching people to be teachers, but also sort of the professional development and the, the things that go on for existing teachers to be better at, um, better in the classroom, better in the building. Um, well, yeah, go ahead. I'm also, I'm also very concerned right now about teachers' mental health, and I'm just going to say that. Um, we've been asked to come in and do some training surrounding teachers engaging in a conversation surrounding mental health. And so it's, it's real. It's, it's all over the place. This year was very challenging for many folks, right? I'm sorry about that puppy dog. Um, but I mean, if we concentrate and look at pe teachers being part of the big picture, okay? Because oftentimes teachers think, you're throwing me another program I gotta learn. You're throwing me this, you're throwing me that. You're throwing me another acronym. I mean, whatever it may be, um, across the board, teachers are, just the most amazing part of a school district. I mean, they hold within their their hands right there um, the love for education, the love for for children. And oftentimes, right now, I hear in many heated discussions, "Oh, teachers don't care about kids. They care about kids. They were doing their best this past year to do what they could do to make this experience better, to make sure that they were taking care of kids, connecting with them via a Zoom meetings." Um, firsthand, I saw it happening in my own living room with my husband having to work that way. So, you know, um, making sure that we respect teachers and their knowledge base and get their, imp get their input, ask for feedback. There's nothing that makes an employee feel better when they're asked for feedback, when I'm engaged in what's going on. It happens, it's for everything. You know, I do a lot of work with businesses on mental health awareness and suicide prevention. And when an employee feels like they're engaged in the movement of what's going on, it's a better buy-in. And, you know, I, I think that it's just so important that um, we also make sure that we start at the elementary level with education surrounding just the word mental, <laughs> mental health. It's really important. And it's basically how you think and how you act and how you feel. So curriculum and involvement from that elementary school level. Um, and also giving our teachers some credit. You know, they do a lot of reading, they listen. Um, we can send this report out. I think it's so engaging, Tim, I'm gonna repeat it. This report is awesome. I sent it to 20 people last night. Um, so that's what I'm feeling. 
Ron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, the other thing I think we need to do is, uh, you know, listen to our students more. You know, education is a $16 billion industry in Michigan, and it's the only $16 billion industry I know that doesn't regularly canvas its customers to ask how they're doing. Uh, you know, I really think that we need to, uh, to use student voice to uh, assess student uh, experiences in the school and to understand uh, what their impediments are. I've never been disappointed when I've asked students to present. Uh, this spring, we field tested a student behavioral health and engagement survey among our Kent school districts. We had 6,000 responses, and we're working now to refine that instrument. And next year, we'll begin in earnest longitudinal study of student behavioral health and their level of engagement in the classroom and in their co core content area. I think we've been very uh, misguided in measuring only their content mastery and not looking at what are the uh, what are the issues or the impediments to their becoming more engaged in their learning. And once we do that, and then we address those issues, we're gonna be far more successful than we are today. Agreed, and I think that that word is just like, it resonates in my head, empowerment, right? I mean, Kids, we talked earlier before um, our um, group came together and Kevin, we were talking just about weighing in on um, social media and cell phones. Uh, we're not gonna go into that right now because it's such a big subject, we need another hour. But um, it is really important that we're sitting here empowering our kids with these devices. Can we empower them to bring about the change in their buildings of bringing mental health awareness, suicide prevention, bringing the ideas for health models, um, kids are super creative and they go, don't get bogged down into the logistics. We did a research on one of our programs that's in schools called Be Nice and kids loved it. They were engaged. They took a hold of it and just would go for it. Whereas the adults would just be thinking and overthinking and overthinking and they'd want to meet and meet and meet and meet. And these kids would put together things. They're so quick. And they, they want to do it. They get energized. And so I totally agree with Ron. It's like, bring them on board. I mean, it's so amazing what, what kids can, can give back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have uh, about five minutes left. Uh, one of the issues I want to get into is the next school year. Uh, we've had kids in and out of the, the classroom, the school buildings this year. Um, the last 15, 16 months have been very stressful for everyone, including our, our young people. Uh, Ron, you mentioned the, the federal money that's available to help schools not deal not only with learning loss, but with, with a lot of other issues. Um, what, if anything, are, are you doing with Kent ISD or, or you're helping to coordinate? How are schools getting ready to meet the mental health needs of their students next year, coming in after, you know, hopefully a good summer and, um, but, but dealing with a lot of these things that maybe are, are peaking because of what we've been through. Well, their schools are investing heavily in uh, their mental health supports to the extent that they're available. You know, your data demonstrates a dearth of, trained professionals. And so that's an area that we really need to address. But our districts are working uh, on, uh, on uh, multi-tiered systems of support. Uh, they're you know, investing in training of their staff and uh, they are uh, you know, desperately hoping that we can A, have the resources to help stabilize students who have significant need uh, when they return in the fall but also that we can have some sense of normalcy that will bring a sense of, of you know, still children love structure and they love the, uh, you know, to know what's going to happen. And, and so the uncertainties that we've found during this COVID period, we, we hope greatly for a, a normal school year to begin next year so that we can begin to identify and address these issues. 
Kevin, you and I have worked a little bit on workforce issues. I know you do a whole lot more than I do on this, but uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts on on our workforce issues, these professionals that we need, uh, not only in the school setting, but but generally we have many, many yeah. counties in northern Michigan, yeah. the Upper Peninsula, uh, where there just there are not these professionals that we need in, in many areas of our medical field. <laughs> Yeah, well, you, you think about that issue very similar to the, the, the teacher shortage that we're experiencing right now and and especially getting, um, you know, uh, teachers into some of the some of the more rural school districts, urban school districts, et cetera, that are uh, suffering most in terms of the teacher shortage. You can ex think about the same similar strategies to address the, the, the gap and the number of mental health professionals that are necessary. So, um, I, I think um, you know incentives to to encourage more psych you know more more people to pursue um, um, uh, a career as a psychiatrist as a psychologist or um, or um, um, social uh, social worker I think is 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 key. What we've seen um, even in terms of um, you know extended our extended family telehealth being a way to serve as a gap. I mean, we've learned so much about what we can do through um, distance, you know, learning and, um, and, you know, meetings like this. And um, it's kind of opened up the doors to solutions that we could have, um, we would never really have thought about, but, you know, doing telehealth with mental health um, support and, and counseling, et cetera, it might be a way to bridge that, that, that um, that geographic gap that we see in the report in terms of those uh, more rural underserved counties across the state, um, that's certainly happening across employment. So I think incentives, um, uh, talking about the occupational demand that exists um, just within these professions, I think is maybe part of the solution, but that's a long-term solution because, you know, it's gonna take, you know, f you know six to, to 10 years to, to make up that demand because people have to go through the education training in order to get there. So um, I think any way that we can use technology is gonna be a short-term solution for us. Yeah. So we are reaching uh, the witching hour and people are gonna get on with their, their jobs. We wanna thank everyone. Um, before we sign off, I wanna give each of you a chance for any uh, final thoughts. Um, what do we take from this, and and what, you know, how do we move forward in a, approaching these issues? Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin, you went last. Let in the beginning, maybe we start with you this time. Mm -hmm. um, I would just say that um, um, what the, I think the report really does a great job at is communicating. Um, this crisis that we're face we're facing, and you can see the the the, the growth and need in in um, from 2007 to I think 2017 or 19 in the report. I think schools, as Ron and Christy know, in terms of their work as professionals, um, can be a a key um, kind of cog in the solution. We've got to address the, the the gap in terms of the number of mental health professionals that are necessary to sort of you know support these students and youth, and then I think also families or the households and and engaging households, uh, both in terms of um, um, raising awareness um, uh, and being part of the solution, but also getting at some of the um, some of the causes. Um, that can do something kind of a three pronged approach with families, schools, and uh, professionals all working together. And I think business can play a big role in being supportive of this is an issue that we have to we have to address as a state. It 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 undermines what we what we seek for everyone in Michigan to be have you know kind of living their best life. Um, and um, and helping Michigan have from our perspective uh, a workforce of the future. So. Uh, I think this is something that we all have to sort of lean into and 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 find a way to support um, the solutions that are, I think in some ways called out in the report and other things that are more sort of societal that we have to just kind of confront and um, um, and uh, and address. 
Yeah, good. Ron, any final thoughts? Uh, you know, I think our attitude regarding uh, mental health needs to change. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a health issue. Uh, our insurers need to cover mental health as they cover health care. Uh, these, are, these are basic things that we need to uh, address as, as a society and know that uh, we are spending far too much money at the, at the least efficient area when we're incarcerating people who have mental illness, when we find people who have mental illness who are homeless. You know, we need to invest those dollars very early on. And we have to get over this idea that it's not a health issue because it is. Very well said. Christy? Ron, that was the best fire up speech that we could close on. I don't even know if I can top that, but um, total agreement. I mean, there is disparity and um, Michigan has a problem ultimately with that. We didn't even touch on that either, that mental health disorders are treated differently in respect to coverage. Um, you can't get better in six appointments necessarily. So why would we cut somebody off from having treatment? Um, but I also wanna thank Tim again, uh, just a great report. And, you know, I do a lot of presentations um, during the week. And um, I'm glad a lot of my stats were right on because <laughs> this, is, this is the picture that I say every day that one in five will struggle with a mental health disorder in a given year, one in 10 with um, a disability, a mental illness that can be disabling to the point where they don't want to go to school. They don't want to engage in anything at their school. And they, they don't want to engage in satisfying relationships. I mean, those are some of the basics. And um, again, thank you so much for the opportunity to be on this panel today. And I look forward to more things to come. I really do. We can't stop here. So mm -hmm. thanks so much. Tim, any final words? Just thank you to the panelists for providing your insights and for your kind words on the report. Uh, we're happy to put it out. Um, and as a person, you know, who where my training is in public health, I always, you know, the, the common phrase is that public health, you know, unlike medicine that you do, you know, to your patients, public health is something that you do with people. And so it's all about partnerships and collaboration and community engagement and ultimately empowerment. And so I hope that this report empowers people to take their mental health seriously and move towards solutions. So thank you all for your help with this. Thank uh, all of our viewers for tuning in. Uh, I, I'm really very happy with, with this. Uh, the report is in its final stages. We've been referencing it. It is not on our website yet, uh, hopefully, very soon next week. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we recorded this. We're going to uh, post it on our website. It'll probably be up in the early afternoon. And you can find all of our work at crcmich.org. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you.